Huh. Watching Kyle's unboxing videos again? Yeah, he always finds the coolest... No way! A robot dog? Gotta ask where he got it. Or use your Samsung Galaxy S24 Ultra. Just draw a circle around the dog on your screen, and it shows you where to buy it right in the app. Oh, I just learned a new trick. And that for once, I beat Kyle to the next big thing. Circle it, find it, with the new Galaxy S24 Ultra, and circle the search with Google. Get yours now at Samsung.com. Internet connection required. Results may vary based on visuals. I think that's what people want to really bask in right now. We want to celebrate Kobe and not focus just on his death, but focus on the arc of his life and the things that he did that were so inspirational that will become lore. Uh, Yesterday was, without a doubt, the worst day of my broadcast career. Whatever it is, he had it. He had it. When you fiercely protect your passion, no one can ever steal your dreams. Kobe's in a class by himself. What do you think set him apart? Well, it's Dr. Phil, and that means you have found your way to fill in the blanks. And this is both a very special and a somber occasion. We're talking about Kobe Bryant who lost his life on Sunday, uh, along with eight other people, one of them being his daughter, and seven other people who we'll talk about. And I am honored to have a very special guest to talk about this with today. He's a dear friend of mine that I've known now for just going on 20 years, Mm -hmm. maybe a little more. And I'm talking about Jim Hill. Jim Hill is a legendary sports broadcaster. He is on uh, KCBS here, and Jim has interviewed every sports great in every sport, from Muhammad Ali to Kobe Bryant, just everybody. And Jim, you're just a, you're an icon. And I know that you are dear friends with Kobe and have covered his career from the beginning. Yeah, I, I thank you for those for those kind words. I, icon, that's that's in your category. I just I just want to go and do my do my job and and do it the best that I can. Yeah, Doc, Kobe's a dear friend, and I will have to say, as I told you before, uh, yesterday was without a doubt the worst day of my broadcast career. To get a call in the morning that something like that has happened. And the first thing you say is, oh, that's not true. Come on, Dad, that's, that's not true. You always think somebody's pulling a hoax or somebody's misinformed and things like that. Jim, how did you find out about it? It was, um, it was the station that called me. And I had just returned from Texas seeing my, uh, my sister. And so I had just got on the ground and the station called and told me what they had heard. And so I immediately doubted it, but was, went on to... Um, investigate. And the more I, the more calls I started to make and the more information I started to get, the more I was convinced that, that something was wrong. And it's just, I'm still speechless, Phil. I, you know, I, I, this isn't supposed to happen. No, it's not supposed to happen. And it's so tragic. And, you know, like Kobe, he was off doing what he loved. You know, he was headed up to his academy there and working with young people and had his daughter with him, and it's just shocking that it happened, and it happened on a Sunday morning that caught everybody unaware. When did you first meet Kobe? I met Kobe when he first came to Los Angeles, and he was getting ready to do an appearance on the show Arliss. Remember Arliss mm-hmm. show? And we were getting ready to do that, and then we, we went down into to Long Beach and did the, did the show down there. And he was, it was amazing. His eyes were big and bright, but he could speak two or three languages. Yeah. And I said, whoa, wow, this, now this is something special. And he, he was, you could, you could tell, like you, you have, you have this great gift of being able to decipher if someone is a phony or not, if he's got it or not. And I could tell right away, whatever it is, he had it. He had it. And you knew from the beginning that he had it. And we talked and we, de- we developed a... Uh, uh, a relationship that lasted up until uh, 
up until yesterday. And there were some things that we have talked about throughout the course of his, his career that, uh, that are just mind-boggling. But I'll, I could always tell that he knew where he was going. He knew what he wanted to do from the very beginning. Phil, I remember the night he scored 60 points against Utah in his last game. And when the game was over, he came out, he had the towel on his shoulders, and he gave a wonderful speech. And then he said, Mamba out. Well, when he said Mamba out, he really, really meant it because he had done all he wanted to do and could do in basketball. A lot of times an athlete will try to come back a little bit, play another year or two, right. wonder if he's supposed to play or not. Not Kobe Bean Bryant. He knew what he, he had been preparing all along for that day when he said Mamba out. And he, in my opinion, he is the singularly most focused athlete I've ever met. I've met and I've met a few. I mean, <laughs> I've met, met a couple. I know Muhammad and Michael and Magic and Tiger. And they, but this guy, when he was on the floor and there, there are... There are sound bites that are legendary of him saying, we want to cut their throat. We want to step on them. We want to stop. And that's what made him the fierce competitor, you know, that he was. But meeting him that day when he got ready to do that, uh, that series of Arliss, I, I knew then. What year was that? This was 20 years ago. He had just got here. And I went back to the station. I said, ooh, this is one special. And then I talked to Jerry West. And Jerry, had, Jerry saw him work out. And Jerry went back and told everybody with the Lakers, I've just seen the best workout of a high school athlete I've ever seen. We've got to get him. And they did. Wow. That's high praise from Jerry West. Oh, because Jerry, Jerry is, uh, and I know you're, you're familiar with, uh, with astrology. Jerry is like my North Star. Yeah. Because sometimes when you, you can't figure stuff out and you kind of wonder... If I call Jerry West, he'll he'll straighten out the whole thing. Yeah, and he has that unique ability of being able to do that, but never ever wants to take any credit for all the wonderful things that he has done. You know, you were comparing him to all of these people that you know, Muhammad and uh, Tiger and other greats, and Kobe's in a class by himself. What do you think set him apart? What made him so special? When I think about it, I think about his work ethic, that he worked so hard. Obviously, he had God-given gifts, but I never knew an athlete to work as hard as Kobe. What do you think set him apart? His passion for the game. Yeah. And he knew what he had to do to, to satisfy that passion. You now, Phil, there were a lot of times when they would go on the road and sometimes win or lose, if he wasn't happy with his performance— he would see and ask if they would keep the gym open so he could go back and shoot more that night after everybody else had left. After a road game. After a road game, yes. He had this passion, this undeniable passion that very few athletes that I have ever met and seen have. And that was, at all costs, whatever it takes, that's what I'm going to do. And that's what he did. And one of the things that made him so popular here is when you play for the Lakers, that's the brand. And when you succeed with the Lakers here in Los Angeles, the, there's, a different, there's a different feeling in the atmosphere. There's a different look among the clouds when the, when the Lakers are in the playoffs. And Laker fans and Kobe would feed off each other. The more he, the better he played, the more they fell in love with him and vice versa. And he always gave it his best, no matter what was going on in his life, professionally or personally, when Kobe Bryant stepped on the floor, he was going to play. There was one time, Phil, and I like to think I know, I know a few stories. Some people say, I say I'm full of stories. Some people say I'm full of something else. <laughs> no, we, want, we want to hear yeah. the stories because you knew him intimately and you oh, knew yeah. things about him. And I think that's what people want to really bask in right now. We want to celebrate Kobe and not focus just on his death but focus on the arc of his life and the things that he did that were so inspirational that will become lore. He loved his family. He loved his family. He loves his girls. We would tease him. 
I said, hey, man, you got, you got a house full of women there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he said, yeah, I'm in a no-win situation. <laughs> <laughs> and, but he, he, loved, he loved his girls. He was, uh, his, uh, his wife, uh, Vanessa, was just such a, a strong part of, of, their, of their relationship. Uh, they would talk things over with each other. Uh, and a lot of times when you would see them out in public, it was like they were on their first date. Yeah, That's how much in love they were with, with each other. And he wrote different things uh, to her. Um, you know, they met on a, um, on a video shoot. He was doing a video shoot, and, and she, was, she was participating as one of the dancers in the video shoot, and that's how he, and that's how he met her. Really? And she, um, she didn't go for it at first. Really? <laughs> oh, he had to sell it. Huh? Oh, he had, he had to sell it. He, you, you thought he sold himself as a basketball. But he, had, <laughs> he had to sell this. this and, and their relationship is one of, uh, of uh, pure love, and you have to be in love with your mate when you are married to someone who is as popular, as internationally known as Kobe was. Um, and she's right there with him. I used, to, we used to, I used to tell him, man, you know, you, you, you married up. And he said, yes, I did. Well, you know, there are so many greats that have played the game, and there are so many greats that are playing now. But Kobe was an international Superstar. I mean, there was nowhere on the globe he could go that people didn't know him. And there are so few people that are known by one name. Mm -hmm. You just say one name, and that's who they are. Tiger, Kobe, Shaq. I mean, just think about it. Magic, Michael, Muhammad, yeah. sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he was that way. And that's not easy to live that way sometimes because you're in a fishbowl and everybody sees you. Did he like celebrity? Yes and no. He liked it when it was on, when he was playing because he knew that his celebrity, his reputation sometimes would give him a little edge over the competition. But uh, when he went home, he was, uh, he was, Hey dad, or Hey honey. And um, what's that saying the guys have when they go home? He had a lot of honeydews. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm not Dr. Phil at my house. Yeah, I, I can understand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you know Robin. You know how that goes. Oh, no. She's, she's, a, she's a wonderful, wonderful lady, and, uh, and both of you are very lucky to have each other. Let me ask you this. What was Kobe like in the locker room, generally speaking? Did the other players really feed off of his passion, or were they intimidated by it? Both. When you do what he was doing and has done— and you're new to this organization, you walk in and there's, there's Kobe Bryant. I'll give you a great example. They were in Utah in the playoffs. And in this particular, in the first half, the Lakers were horrific. They were just awful. So Kobe goes in at halftime and he says quite loudly in front of everybody, if you blankety blank guys are scared to win this blankety blank game, Get out of my blankety blank way, and I'll win it myself. And he did. <laughs> and he did. He did. That's all. That's the confidence that he had in himself, because of his craft and what he knew uh, he could do. He was special, Phil. He, he you, the likes of a Kobe Bryant shall never pass our way again. But you know, just in saying that story about being up in Utah, how many athletes in the history of the sport? How many athletes in any sport? have the confidence to step up in a locker room and make that statement and then go pay it off. That's like Babe Ruth pointing to, sure. the, pointing to the outfield. Sure. Few to say it, even less to accomplish it. And, but when he said what he was going to do and then, and then did it, that just, that just made his teammates and his coaches and his fans believe in him more and more and more and more. That's why um, you were talking. We were talking about uh, athletes recognized by one name. You know, Kobe Bryant's one of the few guys that I've ever met who can walk across the street and stop traffic. Yeah, and people just start yelling, and guys start waving, and ladies start crying, and and it seemed like the 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 sun would come out. He he was a gift to all of us. Like I said, a, a gift that. Uh, We'll never see the likes of this one again. 
he had a quote that was attributed to him, reads, I don't do things for people to understand me. I say things to help them understand themselves. Yeah. Was he kind of a coach player? I mean, did he really help others when he was on the court? I know that he was a very active father, so off the court, I know that was true. Did he help players? Was he a player coach type, or did he just work on himself when he was there? He was the ultimate teammate. He was the, uh, he was the consummate professional. When he got to, like, midway through his career— and you were starting to see that he was becoming, and people were looking at him as bigger than life. Oh yeah, he would tell people what they should do and how they should do it. And nine times out of 10, 10 times out of 10, he was always right. So when he did that and it came true, that just built up the, the trust, which is a very important word, the trust that his teammates had in him. When you, when you listen to uh, the highlights of, of when they were having their three-peats. And I like to watch the bench and listen to the guys when they're on the bench. And you can see how everyone kind of gravitates towards him and they, were, and they were listening to him. Early in his career, it was a different story. He was trying to get acclimated and earn the respect and, every, and everything of everyone. But once he reached that, that point after like year four or five, that's when, that's when the mamba started to come out. And he knew things that were going to happen on the floor long before they did. It's, a, it, it's amazing. It's amazing, Phil. He's just, it's just, a, once again, a gift. And, you know, when you look back at the early times, because we were looking at some of the things early on, and his dad was in the NBA. Mm -hmm. He played for the 76ers mm -hmm. for like eight mm -hmm. years, right? Mm -hmm. Nicknamed Jellybean. Mm -hmm. So he had it in his DNA, that's for yes. sure. And one of the other things that I think really made Kobe to be more advanced uh, was that he went overseas and he was in Italy. So there was a different kind of, of uh, background, a different kind of education, a different kind of living that he went through when he was there. So that when he came here, already he could speak two or three languages. So that put him on a different level than other athletes that were his teammates or athletes that he was playing mm -hmm. against. So they would look at him a little bit different. And when you can get on the court or on the field, when you can get your opponent to look at you in just a little bit of awe, just wonder what in the world are you getting ready to do? Why, you know, how did you do that? Then you got him. And he knew that, he studied that, and he took advantage of it. And he was learning Serbian and French as well. Yes. Oh, yeah. He, and it, he, he was one of the smartest individuals, not just athletes, one of the smartest individuals I've ever met. He knew exactly what he wanted to do with his career. He knew exactly what he wanted to do when he retired. Special is an understatement when we talk, when we talk about him. There's, there's all these stories that are, are legendary about him. And, but then there was sometimes, Phil, when he could be just as innocent and, and not know exactly or try to convince himself that he could play. Like when, when he tore his Achilles tendon, Gary Vitti, terrific trainer for the Lakers, goes out on the floor and tells him, because you know how trainers are, they know immediately. Yeah. And Vitti knew immediately he ruptured his Achilles tendon. Vitti said, Kobe, you know, you ruptured your Achilles tendon. The first thing out of Kobe's mouth was, is there some way we can ro roll it up? Is there some <laughs> way we can tape it up? And Vitti says, no, you have ruptured your Achilles tendon. You can't do that. He said, well, well, maybe, may, maybe there's something we can do to, to get me so I can, I can keep on playing or at least shoot these free throws. And Vitti told him, Vitti said, no, we're going to shoot the free throws and then we're going to get you out of here. So what Vitti did that night was he went, told the referee, told the Lakers, told the opposition, this is what's going to happen. Kobe's going to shoot the free throws, then we're going to call a timeout, and then we're going to get him out of here. He thought he could do almost anything. Or he, he, he thought that, you know what, I can, I can get over this injury. All you have to do is just roll up. How are you going to roll up an Achilles yeah. tendon? Yeah, and he shot the free throws. Shot the free throws and then limped off. <laughs> and the other team 
was good with that. The, the other Nobody, team was good with that. Yeah. The other thing that shows, I think, Phil, is uh, the respect and admiration that everyone in the arena that night had for Kobe and for the game of basketball and for the Lakers. Yeah, you know, he was 17 years old when he became a pro basketball player, and he's the only sixth player in NBA history to go directly from high school into the NBA. Yeah. I mean, you think about a fully grown man, you think about like Carl Malone, so these guys are just monsters, and then a 17 year old mm -hmm. kid that isn't filled out yet, and all, it, it, but he did it. He was running scared yeah. <laughs> for a little while. But the other thing about that, Phil, is the fact that he's 17 years old. He couldn't even pay bills. He had to have other people pay his bills for him. That's one of the, see, the, one of the great heroes um, in Kobe Bryant's life is one Gary Vitti because Gary, trainers have a very close association and affection for their, for their players. And you're hurt and you can't go out and play. You just open your heart and tell the trainers everything. So Vitti helped him in, in a lot of ways, uh, doing things for him and helping him that he couldn't do because of his age. It was interesting in high school, he was quoted as saying, I can't stop Michael Jordan, but he can't stop me either. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was in some and some of the some of the really iconic moments that are caught on tape are when the Bulls were playing the Lakers. And during timeouts or someone is shooting a free throw, you could see the two of them go over and kind of, they would bend over and there was a conversation there that just absolutely had to be priceless. And Kobe, ask, Kobe asking questions and, and Michael being Michael, because he really didn't have to. He could have said, hey, you know what, you know, shut up, Rook, I don't have to talk to you. He would say, he would tell him, you know what, why don't you try this the next time? Well, do these kinds of things. Yeah. That's, the, that's the graciousness of, of Michael Jordan and, the, um, and, the, uh, and Kobe being very inquisitive. Yeah. You've talked to a lot of people since it happened Sunday. Who have you talked to and what have they had to say about it? I know you talked to Jerry West. Jerry is, uh, man, because Jerry is very special to me. He's he's given me some advice that uh, that is is so it's, it's just invaluable. Some of the things that he's told me and given me advice on. We talked about when he first saw Kobe, and I told him I said, "Yeah, you were the one that mentioned you know we should do it." He says, "No, no, no. Jerry is Jerry doesn't like to have a lot of." As you know, you know him. He doesn't yeah. like to have a lot of credit thrown. I've known him thrown for about him. 15 years, and he is a very humble guy. Oh, he's the, he's the most humble guy I've ever met. And, and it's really amazing. In basketball, it's like complete opposites. He's yeah. the most humble guy in an, in, the, the organi in an organization dealing with a sport that has all these massive egos. Yeah. But when you're the, uh, when you're the logo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Jerry helps in ways that you don't imagine because he will plant an idea and you can come up with the answer. I've seen, I've seen you do that a lot of times um, because one of the gifts that you have, I think, is you make us think, which is sometimes what we don't do enough of. And sometimes if we do think, we can solve a situation. We can get through a particular thing. And, 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 that's, and that's one of the things that, that he did. And, you know, he, he, gave, he gave Kobe some advice personally, good and bad, that helped Kobe see the light. Kobe said, oh, you know what? Okay. Okay. It's going to be bad now. It's going to be bad tomorrow. But maybe two days from now, I'll start to see the light. And the more those things happened, the more he believed in Jerry, mm -hmm. and the more he found out Jerry West knew what he was talking about. Yeah, he had had to shake him when he heard about Kobe. Who do you think this has rattled the most out of who you've talked to? Jerry. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Jerry said uh, said to me, he says, you know, I, I feel like I've lost a I feel like I've lost a son. Um, he said. He's a once in a 
generation, individual, player, personality. And he said, he said, Jim, this is the worst day for me. This is just the absolute worst. And for Jerry to say something like that, because, you know, he, Jerry is, uh, Jerry's like you, Phil. He's brutally honest. Yep, if he yes. likes you, he tells you. If he doesn't like you, he tells you even faster. And he's pretty stoic. Oh, yes. You're the logo, so you carry a lot of weight. Yeah. I'm Katie Maloney, 37, a divorcee, and I'm out here falling in love every day with myself. And I'm Dana Kathan, 33, former needy mess and delusional Leo, but I've never been happier. Never been happier. You know that. Good. <laughs> the foundation of this podcast is for people who want to live their life unapologetically. It's a safe space for anyone who's going through a transition in their life or just dealing with the regular bullshit. It's a religion. We're not saying that we're looking to start a coven, but that might be why we started but this podcast. But we're not saying that. Join our cult. I mean, community. I mean, the coven. Religion. Okay, let's just stick with community. Listen to the podcast. Listen to the podcast. <laughs> when you think about L.A., and the country is the same way, but when you think about L.A., this city is in mourning. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. You go around. I did interviews coming in today on the phone, you know, as I was driving in, doing radio and stuff like that, and listening to callers and that sort of thing. Kobe was a role model for so many young people, mm -hmm. and they looked at him almost as a superhero. Mm -hmm. And when young people admire somebody so much and they look at them in that way, they're supposed to be invincible. And then when they're not, that really rattles people, uh, particularly young people. It's like, whoa, that wasn't supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. And then it scares them. It's like, if that can happen to him, then that can happen to me. And so kids have really been rattled by this because they held him in such high esteem and high regard. And I think I've been asked so much by parents, you know, what do we say to our kids about this? Because, I mean, he was a hero. They, everybody wants to be Kobe. You know, they'd mm -hmm. be out playing. I'm Kobe Bryant, and there's 10 seconds left, and I'm bringing the ball. You know, they play those games in the mm -hmm. driveway and stuff, and it's really rattled a lot of folks. Uh, some of the things that we, we have been talking about along those same lines are, I've talked to uh, guys that didn't want to go to work. Yeah. And... He says, oh, Jim, I just, I just don't, I just, I just don't feel. I say, okay, well, let me ask you this: What do you think Kobe would say to you if you said that? Oh, he'd say for me to go to work. There you go, go to work. See, that's how much belief everyone, or mostly everyone, had in him because of the dedication he had to his craft. He would go out and prove it. He also proved a lot sometimes that he is, he is vulnerable. But he also came back and proved how he can make. See, as you know, we love stories of people that overcome obstacles. You know, you get knocked down on your back and get back up and go and rise back up again. And he did that. And he did it with grace and charm and style and class and elegance. And when you do that, you parents can say, you see, you see what Kobe did. But look at what happened after this. I th he's just. He, he, he epitomizes everything that we want to try to do within our, in our professional lives and our personal lives. If you make a mistake, admit it and move on. You saw him with his girls. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, oh, Gianna yeah. and Bianca. What was he like with, with the girls, Natalia? What was he like with them? He was daddy. He was daddy. I remember I went down to see him, and, you know, when he stopped playing and started uh, writing books, and I, I bought this book here for you. It's called Legacy and the Queen. And he would have total say-so over everything in the book, obviously. And he would take it home and, and show his daughters. He would say, well, what, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And they would look at him and say, oh, Dad. Dad, no, 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 no. That, that's, that's not going to cut it. And he, was, uh, <laughs> he knew them because a lot of times our young people see things that we can't see. They see things as pure. It's almost like when a um, um, someone who's doing uh, cu cooking a f cooking something to eat or in a restaurant or something, and they come up with this new product, who do they have to taste it? The young people. Yeah, of course. They taste it first and they do what they do. But yeah. this, uh, can I can I read something? For Please. This is in the, in the front of his book called uh, Legacy and the Queen, and he wrote here to Nani 
Gigi, BB, and Coco, my four beautiful, spirited, strong daughters. Here's where it gets you, Phil. He says, quote, when you fiercely protect your passion, no one can ever steal your dreams. Yeah. That's, that's some strong, powerful stuff. That's stuff that gives you goosebumps. It's stuff that, um, that makes you want to, makes you think, and it makes you appreciate him for who he is and what he did, you know, for all of us. It's, uh, I also, I also think of, um, of a thing by Muhammad and, uh, Muhammad was, uh, there was a saying that he, that he had when he said the, the man who has no imagination stands still for he cannot fly. And Kobe has spread his wings of imagination so he could soar. And, and learn all these wonderful, beautiful things about life, about people, and about business. And, and we're going to, it's, it's, uh, Phil, we just, we were talking the other day, not the, a little while ago. He's not going to see his daughters graduate. Won't get to see him, won't get to walk down the aisle with him. Um, I, it's just a bad, bad day. And they won't get the experience with him. And, you know, it's just so tragic. You know, you spent time with him one-on-one. -on -one. You reported on him. You interviewed him. You had access to him. But I don't think anybody else on the planet had. He'd like to talk to you. And there was such an ease when you talked to him. But you also talked to him off camera. And you two spoke as friends, just guys talking. What meant the most to you having the relationship you did with Kobe? How did it affect you? What kind of experience did you have with him? The thing that I treasure the most about my relationship with Kobe was trust. To me, trust is the most important quality you can have, not only as uh, doing what I do as a reporter and stuff, but in just in everyday living. Trust, like trust between you and you and, and, and your wife, you and your kids, trust between you and your and your employer. If that trust is there, then there things just kind of naturally open up. And I hope he trusted me because I trusted him. And um, I have, uh, I've been asked to um, write books and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I know way. And, le and let me take you back. I'll go back to Jerry. Jerry says, you're not writing a book. I said, I'm not? He says, no. He said, the reason you're not is because if you do, they'll lose trust in you. It doesn't make any difference who it is. And um, he said, when you have that quality, that is the most important quality that anyone can have for another. It doesn't have to be reporter and athlete. It could just be, it, it could be husband and wife. It could be employee, employer. It could be just friends, anything. But when there's that trust factor that's there, that's when you know you've, you've, you've made an imprint. And so um, having his trust to tell me certain things, mm -hmm. uh, having his, and, and the other thing is, and I know you've gone through this and you go through this every day. You could be sitting and talking with someone about something that's very, very delicate and sensitive and personal. And both of you know without saying it's off the record. Yeah, of course. Man, that's when you when you have that. Yeah, that you you you, you can't buy that. That's 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 something that's that's given to you from from big person upstairs. Well, that's what I'm saying. You were the one person, certainly the one person in the media, the one journalist that he had that trust and relationship with. He did not do that with anybody else. One of my big concerns is while there's all this good of everyone praising him and talking about how great he was and things like that, it's somewhere out there, somewhere out there, there's some con artist who's going to try to say, okay, you know what? I read and read about how much he's worth and this and that and the other. I've got nothing to lose. I'm going to try and do something. Yeah. 
Yeah, somebody will try to cash in. Yes. Somebody will try to create some scandal, the real story behind so-and-so. And they come out of the woodwork. I hate it. I hate it every time I see it. And, you know, in 18 years of being on the air with Dr. Phil, I've never one time had a tell-all book on the show. Mm -hmm. I just won't do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had so many where they've been together and then split or they had something going on and then something divides them and one of them comes and is going to rat the other out and write some book or whatever. And publishers call, authors call. Mm, mm, not on my show. Yeah. I, I mean, ain't going to do it. It's, it's, ama it's amazing what that In God We Trust Federal Green will do to us as individuals and to us with our, with our families. Yeah. But, you know, there's a parental legacy that, you know, we all grow up with. My dad was a bad alcoholic, and I haven't had a drink in over 50 years because I just didn't want to, you know, carry mm -hmm. that forward. And I know Kobe was disappointed with his parents. And then I see how he does with his family and his girls. And it just seemed to me that they had him wrapped around their little fingers, and he loved every minute of it. His girls? Oh, yes. Oh, 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 yes. He, he, he loved his girls. He would, he would take them to basketball. It, it would be, just, it would be just like he and his girls. Yeah. Nobody else. A lot of times, a lot of times Vanessa would go. And sometimes Vanessa wouldn't go. But he would always take his girls. I mean, look at he had one of his girls with him going to a camp. So he, he, for as great a basketball player as he was Hall of Famer and everything. It's hard for you to talk about him in the past tense, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, I, 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 I. That's the first time you've been able to do it since we yeah. sat down. It's, he, it's hard to think. He, Phil, he, he still lives in my heart. Um, he was a good friend. I mean, there were times when he would talk to me about some issues that I might have. And it could it it could be something very simple, or and you know he he was a good reader of individuals. I could say, "Hey, Kobe, how you doing?" He'd say, "Jim, how are you? Uh, what's up with you? Are you okay?" Yeah. Um, he I introduced him to my my nephew. His name is Legend Lee. Yeah. What a great name, Legend yeah. Lee. So he came out came out of the locker room. He was walking down walking down the uh, the aisle, and he Jimmy the Hill. Cope, how you doing? Oh, that. It's my nephew, Legend Lee. Legend Lee, man, what a name. Legend? Do you know what you have to do to live up to legend? <laughs> and my nephew, yeah, yeah, I'm cool about it. No, oh, man, you better so and so. And it's instantly, whoever he talked to, whoever he gave encouragement to, it would brighten their day. And in young people, not only for my nephew, but any young person that came in contact with him, they will remember it for the rest of their lives, and it will make a difference. It'll make a it'll it'll make a big difference. They will be better young men and young women because of. Yeah, you don't him. forget it. You don't forget it. No, no, not at all. The second half, you know, the after basketball. I mean, he wins an Oscar. Mm -hmm. He's going into all these other things. What were his dreams? What was his plan? What was he going to do? Writing these books, yeah, he he jumped he jumped right into it, Legacy and the Queen. I mean, he got an Oscar, yeah, for for Dear Basketball, yeah. Um, he's one of the few individuals who completely planned what they were going to do when they finished, and he used his he used his career to not only he used his career to to draw attention to him so that it would create a bigger stir so that when he went in after his career was over, his name would be and mean even more. Right. But you, you also know, and some people may think it kind of strange, he was bigger overseas than he is here in the United yeah, States. that's what I'm saying. I mean, he's I guess, huge overseas. When he would go overseas, Phil, he wouldn't be able to leave his hotel room without six, eight, ten bodyguards. And that was just to go to an event. That's how much he's revered there. There's, there's that old saying is, um, 
you're always uh, some people are are appreciated more across the street than you are at home. Mm-hmm. Um, in this case, we loved him here, but across the water, he was he was a god there. Yeah, you know, spending the time he did in Italy, mm-hmm. he had those ties there, mm-hmm. and then with the NBA doing what they're doing overseas. He was such an ambassador for the game. He was such an ambassador for the United States. I mean, when you think about the statistics for professional sports, 80% of the athletes within two years of being out of the league are struggling in one or more areas of their life Mm -hmm. because they're not given the kind of counseling and help that they need when they get in. And, And a lot of them you know, spend the money like they're going to have it every year for the mm-hmm. next 30 years instead of five years or four years or two years or whatever it might be. But then there are those that that doesn't happen to. And Kobe being a perfect example of that. You think about Kobe and Shaq and Barkley and Emmett Smith in the NFL and Roger Staubach, just different people that are a bigger success after their successful career than they were during yeah. their successful career. And I just know that's where Kobe was headed. Mm-hmm. Sure. Look at, look at what Magic has done. Exactly. Magic's perfect yeah. example. Uh, Magic, I remember, <laughs> I remember one of the first times I met and sat with Magic. He told me then, he said, I want to be a big businessman when I retire. Yeah. So I said, okay, fine, good, good. So as a joke, I bought him a, a briefcase. Yeah. <laughs> gave him the briefcase. So now, and then people were starting to laugh at him and tease him and joke with him about that. Now those people who laughed and teased Magic then, they want to work for him now. Yeah. He's, he's another special one. Yeah, he is. Robin and I were with him in Cookie Nut terribly long ago and he's very focused yes and as passionate about what he's doing now as he was then and i just know that's where kobe just in the short time look at everything that's happened it's just astounding and i no one can say well we've never heard of this and i and that's a that's a really dumb thing to say but i i I choose i choose to remember the good as opposed to uh the bad or the controversial. I choose to believe in dreams. Um, I, um, I just, I, I just like people who work hard, knowing there's going to be some pitfalls along the way. Maybe you stumble into a couple of pitfalls, but you get right up. And at the end of the, like the quote is, at the end of the day. You're, you're, you're a success. He's a, he's a very special man. Um, he's, he's one that a lot of people, uh, a lot of businessmen I know now aspire to be like because of his dedication right. and, and the things that, that, he, that he believes in. And uh, I, just, I just like the idea of how the great family man that uh, Kobe was. Well, like so many it's not a success only journey he didn't have a perfect run through life and you know people can talk about those things and the controversies but i look at him as obstacles that he overcame yeah and he managed them he dealt with them and he overcame them and i think a lot of them there was more made out of it than mm-hmm. it should have been some of them maybe not but you know he certainly overcame it and you know when he was headed up there to do what he was doing. There were eight other people in that helicopter besides him. Coach John Altabelli and his wife, Carrie, and their daughter, Alyssa, were lost. I just hate that for that family. And, you know, sometimes when somebody that is as big a household name as Kobe is, you see the headline and it's always, you know, Kobe Bryant and others. Yeah. And... You know, I don't want to disrespect those others. The Altabelli family has to just be in shock. I mean, they've lost a father and a mother and a daughter. I cannot even imagine what that family's going through now. Did you happen to know? No, I, uh, I just I just knew of the coach and and, and his yeah. and his great his great reputation. And, and see, that was the other thing. 
Kobe was reaching out to other people in other areas to to do good things. Yeah. And uh, and and I'm and I'm glad I'm glad that that you brought that up because sometimes um, in great tragedy like this, there are some other things or other individuals that get lost in the mm-hmm. in the in the thought process simply because their name is not a significant or a big name yeah. a popular name so but it's um i, I sometimes I'm, I'm at a loss for words feel like because you like i said earlier i keep thinking this is a bad dream yeah you think you're gonna wake you're up gonna from wake it. up yeah but and they do not just think of all the people we're talking about it just because of our experience with him and now we've got these families that are sitting there today. And it's like, can I have a do-over? And did you know Christina Mauser, the coach that was working with Gigi? Yes, knew of, knew of the work that they were that they were doing. See, Kobe was 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 really getting into helping his daughters play and things like that. So that yeah. helped him get, you know, get into that particular level of of education. And when you have when you have a Kobe Bryant who's doing that with his with his daughters, and that just naturally just kind of seeped over to the rest of the team and the rest of the school. Yeah, Christina Mauser was on a helicopter, and Sarah and Peyton Chester, and so their family is is suffering. And then the pilot, of course, yeah, Aero Zabanian, his family has got to be just hurting, and probably a lot of people. Saying yeah. things unkind about the pilot, yeah, which yeah. you know always happens anytime there's a crash. There's unkind things said about the pilot, and we just don't know what caused it. You just can't know. Yeah. When you don't know, that's when you start guessing and assume a lot, mm-hmm. and and it's and it's really difficult to remain calm and wait and hold off. That's why the people that I've talked to. Uh, about about it, I would always say, you know, just keep the faith. Well, you know, there's speculation about the weather and all, but it could turn out two years from now that you find out that a small part manufactured two years ago mm-hmm. caused a malfunction in the instrumentation or something. You just never know, right. so you can't jump to conclusions. You just don't know, and that's not what we need to focus on right now anyway. And, you know, I'm sure there are people that are saying, what's the big deal? A basketball player had a crash. And if you're not a basketball fan, if you're not someone in the NBA that doesn't understand how special and unique this individual Mm -hmm. was, I mean, this was like the Muhammad Ali of basketball. Mm -hmm. This was the one that stood out above the rest. There's like Michael Jordan and Shaq. And Kobe, there are just very few that really are that way. And they're thinking, well, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that this was somebody that was a real escape for people. You know, you find your your heroes in sports and you live vicariously through them. You cheer for them. They're your distraction. They're someone that you can really follow and celebrate their successes and 60 points in a game Mm -hmm. and all of that. And it's very therapeutic for people. And so you invest in them just like you do your team. You know, you see people that are cowboy fans to the end and they're Laker fans to the end. And then when something like that happens, you really do feel a sense of loss because you've felt a sense of camaraderie. And so it's not silly for people to grieve about this. And, you know, I want people to know that if you're grieving about this or anything else for that matter, that grief is not an illness and therefore it's not something you get over. There's no cure. You just adjust and you learn to think about it in different ways. And I always encourage people to talk about it. And, you know, I never saw the value in funerals and memorial services and all until I went to my father's. Yeah, I'd been to others, but when I went to my father's and I heard and saw all the things that were said and honored 
him for the things that he did in the latter parts of his life, it was very cathartic. And I think there's going to be a lot of that in communities. And I really encourage people to participate in that if they feel moved to do so, because I think if you feel like, all right, I've honored this person, we've had a memorial, there's been a rite of passage here that's taken place, it can be helpful, it can Mm -hmm. be cathartic for them. And I encourage people to talk about it. Anytime something's really bothering you, it's real easy to feel like, gosh, I'm the only one that feels this way. And you're not. And if you can talk about it and talk to friends and you know, go to your kids' game and talk about it there with other parents that are sports enthusiasts or whatever. It can really happen. And I also encourage people, sometimes the pain is so great that we focus on the day, the moment of a person's death, and it overshadows the process of their life. Mm-hmm. Kobe created so much joy and so much inspiration to so many people for so many years, it would be such a disservice to overlook that and let the moment, the date of his death, overshadow a process of his life. We need to celebrate everything we had with Kobe instead of just focusing on the loss of Kobe. I mean, we had him the time we had him, and I'm not saying that that makes it okay, but it feels good to acknowledge everything that he accomplished. Like Mm -hmm. you said, what would he say if somebody said, I don't feel like going to work? He'd say, go to work. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. and you think, well, I don't feel good about this. Well, you know, I I know when I go, I want people to think about the things I achieved, not just the day that I died, and I hope people will not feel like they're dishonoring him by telling stories and laughing about great Mm -hmm. things that he did. I mean, that's very helpful. It's almost like, and I'm sure you'll tell me if I'm right or not, it's almost like when you look at things, the glass should always be half full and not half empty. Exactly. And you celebrate that it's half full. And the main thing I want people to do, and look, if you don't create meaning to your suffering, if you don't create meaning to a loss, it can really drive you insane. And the lesson that I take when I see something like this happen is do not let the sun set another day without saying or doing the things you need to say or do to the people in your life that you love because you don't know if the sun's going to come up tomorrow. I mean, we can think, you know, I I need to tell my parents more that I love them. I need to hug my kids more. I need to tell my spouse more. I need to do this or that. Do it. Don't put it off. Do it. I will guarantee you, when Kobe left the house to go to the camp, nobody predicted that was going to happen. I may not get to the end of this sentence. Somebody listening to this podcast in their car You know, it may be the last drive they ever take. Don't procrastinate. Take the initiative. Pick up the phone. Call your mom. Call your dad. Call your brother and say, hey, you know, this untimely death of Kobe just really reminds me and moves me to call you and tell you I really love you and I appreciate you and thanks for everything you've done in my life. Because if you lose that person, the fact that you did that will be worth its weight in gold. I've heard and just the last few hours of parents who went home and said, I just want to go hug my kids. Yeah. Uh, I just want to go tell my wife, I love you. Or I just want to go tell my husband, you know, I love you. I'm sorry that we had this argument and things like that. Um, that's no truer words have ever been spoken. And it, a lot of times I think we don't, we don't use just common sense, common courtesy. Uh, Sometimes we let our egos um, get in the way and we're too, we're too prideful. Um, We're too, we're too macho. Uh, Instead of being 
uh, too kind. Uh, that is, that's one of the reasons why, Phil, we are, we are so blessed and honored uh, to have you to, to do what you do. You've, you've helped a lot of people, but you don't know really how many people you've helped because they're out there in the masses. And they may only watch out of, let's say, out, out of a, uh, an hour show that's on, they may only watch just five or six minutes. But it's the most five or six important minutes they've ever had, and they will remember that. And I've, I've, I've heard people say, well, you know, that's not what Dr. Phil said. And other people will say, well, how do you know what Dr. Phil said? Well, I watched him the other day, and Dr. Phil said we should do this, this, this. Oh, well, really? Well, tell Dr. Phil to come and pay in bills then. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and they yeah. said, okay, I'm going to call it. But, you, but see, what, what happens is you, you, make, you make us think. You, you make us want to do good. We want us, you make us want to do right. And in a lot of ways, that's what Kobe was doing. He was making us think. Yeah. He wanted to do right. There's, there's potholes along the way. Of course. We all, we all know that. But uh, on the other side, I've, I, just, I, just, I just know there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be much better off for having Kobe Bryant here in Los Angeles and in our lives. And not only to show us that he um, was a fabulous basketball player, but he was a terrific family man and he cared about his community. Put young kids through school. He encouraged them, and they would take his word for it when the kid wouldn't necessarily heed the word at home. That's the kind of influence yeah. that. And when you when you have that kind of influence with our young people, you're on the right track. How did you feel about the um, games that were doing the 24 second violations to observe I that was so cool Kobe I, I I thought that was very moving I got and um, very respectful yeah, I got goosebumps because I wasn't expecting it but it just goes to show you the knowledge and the the input that sports has on our community sports mm -hmm. has uh, has on us in our everyday lives and these teams know what those tributes mean not only to them but to their fans yeah. and when the fans go home to then they spread the word and spread the word and there's going to be more there's there's uh there's talk now of of retiring um the number 24 on every team mm -hmm. um there's talk of doing of doing you know you know a lot of other things when you when you have someone that's held in that kind of esteem mm -hmm. You don't get much better than that, Phil. No, I saw some of the games and the opposing players were standing next to each other while it was happening mm -hmm. and they'd just hand the ball to the other yes. and they'd do the yes. same thing and showed people in the crowd. It was really respectful yeah. and really very moving. And I was really glad they, that they took the time and I felt like people at home and in the crowds were really moved. And the the wonderful thing about it is when you – when you admire and you respect an individual, sometimes the game itself has to take a back seat to admiring this individual. The Lakers have always done the right thing. Yeah. The Clippers are doing the right thing. And that's why the game at Staples Center between the Lakers and the Clippers uh, has, been, uh, has been postponed. That is a sign of class and dignity and respect and admiration and love for Kobe Bryant. And it was going to be a Laker home game. Well, that feels right to me. Yeah. That feels right to me it does. To, to go dark mm -hmm. in observance of that because, you know, that's where he played. That's his home and that's their home game. It, to, to call time out mm -hmm. and go dark feels right. Yeah. And when you, when, you think about, when you think about the Lakers— like I said, the Clippers are doing it too. But the Lakers know they are an iconic franchise and they know what they say and do reverberates around the world. And for them to show this kind of love 
and to get the Clippers to go and show that same kind of love and respect and admiration. You could say it all started yesterday with with them running down the 24 second clock because that was Kobe's number. So yeah. um, sports is a great metaphor for life and we learn a lot. And what we can learn from this game being postponed is that there are more important things in the world than sports. And sports can also help us get through some very, very difficult times, which is what, which is what's going on right now. Yeah. Well, my heart goes out to the Bryants, the Altabellis, the Mausers, the Paytons, and the Zobayans, who those families are all in pain right now and in shock. And um, my heart and prayers go out to those families, and I know yours do as well. Oh, yeah. That's why, one of, that's why my favorite saying all the time is keep the faith. Yeah. Because sometimes it's, it's hard to, to, uh, to maintain a positive outlook when things are so dark and gloomy and dreary. And it, it's really a shame that bad always overshadows good. But with your help, Phil, and, and what you do and what you say and the gift that you have, you will be able to, and you are able to turn the tide and to make us all think. And when we start to think, we, we really start to realize that there is another way. And it's tough. It's, it's real tough. I mean, it, I, I was thinking coming, coming here today of, of uh, when, when, I, when I lost my mother on the Friday before Mother's Day. Oh. And, um, and I never got to say goodbye to her. So these kinds of things make you think about other things and about what you can do better the next time in your life and I um, I thank you man I, I you are a gift from the heavens well you're very kind to say that and um, I, I just want to help people get through tough times you know yeah. well we yeah. we need you now these yeah. are these are these are very difficult times we're going we're going through and not just in LA, not just in the United States, but as you know, around the world. Yeah. So we we need the the voice of, of of Dr. Phil to 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 make us realize there is a light at the end of the tunnel. That it's gonna shine brighter, but we have to we have to use some common sense and logic. Well, we do, and I just hope everybody goes through it together because if you talk about it, you feel a whole lot better and. He was universally loved, so we all share in that. I'm honored that you came here today and sat down and talked to me, Jim. Thank no, you very much. Not as not as honored as I as I am. Wait till I tell him at the station. <laughs> wait, wait till I tell him at the station. I went back and I was on a podcast with Dr. Phil. And they're gonna say, It's not April Fool's Day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Thank you so much, Dr. Jim. Thank Appreciate you, it, sir. Appreciate thank it. Thank you, Phil. Thank right. you.